Hello and welcome back to the Pretty Serious Bike Racing Podcast. I'm Dane Cash and it's Monday, September 25th. As of recording time, it's getting to that part of the year where the racing is starting to get a little quieter. But fortunately, we had some very entertaining racing over the weekend in Europe at the Continental Championships. We're going to get to that in a bit. We'll talk a little bit about some of the interesting things that came out of Luxembourg, and we'll do a little wrap of Grand Tour season, men's and women's, now that the Vuelta's in the books, now that all all the Grand Tours of the year are in the books. We're still finding time to be pretty serious, even in late September, even as the leaves start to fall, and I can't wait to get serious with Cosmo Catalano, bike racing analyst extraordinaire. Cosmo, happy Monday. How are you? I, I am well, trying to see if I can make a joke about Euros being actually worlds because cycling is so European-centric, but I don't know. I'm well. That's all I got. Your point is made either way. You know, like, I mean, this, even if there this, wasn't a clever joke involved, you made a good point there. This yeah. is traditional worlds weekend, is it not? Or was? the previous? Yeah. yeah, when there's not, yeah, when we don't have it in the weird time of year that we had it this year. Uh, we are joined by, well, Ruth... I usually I, I like to go digging through pro cycling stats to to grab you know a highlight a result for you. I don't have to do that this time. You just want a bike race. Would Chwamagon even show up on pro cycling stats? Well, I yeah, know I don't know that they high enough level race. I don't, know, well, I don't know that they have that sort of race <laughs> on, on. on. But you know, now that you're an off road pro, uh, you went out and won Schwamagon. And um, first of all, congratulations. Thank uh, you very much. Second of all, our listeners should know that uh, we were. We were texting back and forth trying to schedule the next uh, pretty serious appearance for Ruth last weekend. And she sent a text. It was like 7 in the morning, you know, hey, busy weekend. And then a few hours later, I saw that um, Ruth Edwards had won Schwam again. <laughs> and I thought, that, that, does, that, that qualifies. Because, you know, sometimes <laughs> you say, like, I say busy weekend if I'm going to go on a long ride that day or something. And I, you did go on a long ride, but you also won a bike race. So congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good day at work. Did you have a good time? Yeah, it's a fun event, um, and it's a big uh, race for Trek bikes because it's out there in the Midwest, not far from their head office. So it's a fun event that it's mountain bikes, and you're just playing in the woods, and then it's a little bit more fun because when you're sponsored by a big company that's close <laughs> by, there's a bunch of people that are also just extra stoked for you. So it's all good. Just gives a little bit more credibility, I think, to the pod because otherwise it's just like two dudes who like watch racing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also now the winner of a, of a recent bike race, which is cool. All right, so we're going to start the conversation about Euros in a second. But first of all, I want to tell you about Escape Collective, the, the media outlet for whom we are podding today, the pod network we're on. We are supported by people like you. The listeners, and we just we would love for you to head on over to escapecollective.com slash join to sign up because support from people like you is what allows us to do cool things like this podcast. And you know, even if you're like a few minutes into the pod here and you're wondering, eh, is this even a good podcast? That's fine. <laughs> you can also listen to placeholders, you can listen to Geek Warning, you can listen to Wheel Talk. We have a lot of other great podcasts, and we do all that supported by people like you. So I actually, I want to clarify that you can't listen to this podcast and Geek Warning. There is that is against the rules. Oh, is that you need we to have pick decided one. that you have to yes. pick one? Yes. Okay. There's a there's a whole separate feed for each of the podcasts as well, so you can subscribe to individual podcasts if you really don't want to listen to us or or Geek Warning. You can do that. Um, although I'm I feel like I'm supposed to say that you need to listen to all of our pods. Uh, so yeah, head on over to escapecollective.com slash join and sign up. You become part of a pretty cool community. And on that note, I'm going to give a shout out to some of our lifetime members. We're so grateful for them. So thanks to Ryan Cooper, Tate Wright, Nathan Cotting, and Ryan Murphy. And also Jasmine Zitter. I said Jasmine Z last time because I was looking at your username, not your actual name. I just wanted to give your full first and last name. The, the credit that it deserves. So thanks, Jasmine. All right, on with the show. Let's talk Euros. Uh, Cosmo, just give us a really, really quick set-the-scene summary. What happened in the women's race? 
I think everybody was waiting for the Dutch team to be dominant. Uh, we saw some breaks go. About 40k to go, there was a break with Elise Schabe in it from Switzerland, who shouldn't be a surprise. 35k, they had about 30 seconds, and then the, the Dutch team chased, and by 20k they were or 29k they were caught. Uh, we saw a bunch of attacks. Um, really, it seemed like the Dutch were trying to get a small group away with a rider in it. Um, a, a pretty good tactic on that course. And then after a series of those, around 19k to go, Royster attacked from Switzerland. Um, uh, she strung the group out into the climb again around the final lap. Uh, tried to get away once it was lined out. Made a little separation, but still didn't stick. Um, Royster attacked again after another series, trying to get clear, and then Misha Bredewald countered when everyone was kind of sick of having these attacks and chases, and nobody brought her back because she had about 20 teammates, and uh, she's super strong. So she held on for a solo win, and then we saw, uh, I think, Demi Vollering lead out uh, Lorena Vibis, who had a super high cadence sprint up the hill to beat Lada Kopecky for a second. So if you look at the top 10 of this race, you'll kind of understand why the European Continental Championships matters, because I, I don't, I, we had a conversation in the escape slack and in, in some meetings you know how much how much do people really care and the, the fact is european pros seem to care the ones the ones who go here seem to care and if you look at the top 10 you'll understand that clearly this is a pretty big race i mean you have most of the big stars of right now contesting this european title and in the end we get a good look at cool Interesting, unusual, we'll talk about this in a bit, uh, team tactics based on riders racing for their country teams, which, you know, we don't often see. One thing we we do sometimes see, maybe a theme for the weekend, is a single team, a single trade team doing quite well, even though their riders are split across multiple nations. SD Works taking all three spots on the podium in the women's race. Again, a theme for the weekend. Yeah, but anyway, this is this is a good example of why this is such an important race. Yes, it's it's a continental championships, but at the same time, it's it's riders like Bredewald and Weebus and Kopecky and Demi Vollering. How how did the SD Works kind of t- trade team dynamics come into play here? Did did do you feel like they came into play at all? Do you feel like riders were letting each other go, or was this a case? I mean, it certainly seemed like Royster was was fully interested in, in racing for Switzerland and not racing for SD Works. I wouldn't say that I saw a ton of just SD Works teamwork. I think they all looked like they wanted to win, to be honest. I think the Dutch definitely raced together in a really aggressive manner, but there were honestly so many attacks um, by a lot of people that I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I, yeah, I just didn't see it specifically SD Works in my mind. I, I totally agree. I think I think we saw maybe both sides, uh, between the men's and the women's race, we saw both sides of this weird thing where you switch to a national team every so often. This felt a little bit like, like the All-Star game, where you had players who are normally competitors, riders who are normally competitors working together. Like Florcha Mackay and, and Sheeran Van Enroy did a ton of work for uh, the Dutch team that was predominantly but not entirely... Uh, Este works focused, and I think yeah, like Royster was definitely not racing that. To, she she she. It was almost like she was seeking a moment where she could know that her 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 normal trade team teammates were weaker or not going to get in a move, and try and break that elastic, try and keep the Dutch team from chasing her, get away with strong riders who weren't on the Dutch team and who weren't Este works riders. Um, I I I thought it was really cool to see that. I thought it it looked a lot more. I'll talk about this in the men's race. Look more a lot, a lot more on the level than what we saw on their side. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought this was this was national team racing kind of at its best. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm extremely uh, pro baseball analogies. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, I guess All Star Game could be any. You could be referring to. I, I mean, I always think of the basketball All Star Game basketball, You're thinking of the basketball because. Game. Because basketball has such a pickup vibe to it sometimes. And I think, like, this almost felt like a Wednesday ride with a bunch of teammates who are looking to throw down against each other for, for, um, instead of racing for each other, which you, you sort of get in the All Star game in basketball where it's a bunch of players who can 
throw alley oops to guys who are they're never allowed to pass the ball to most times. So that's I what I was kind of anti basketball actually now, wow. analogies. So uh, wow. you know I don't support that one as much. I got you know say. you know um, Europeans really like basketball too. They so. do, and they don't care at all about baseball based on the conversations that I've had with coworkers either from Europe or Australia. Uh, all right, I thought that we saw Marlon Royster. We saw what it's like for her when she's racing for Switzerland, which you know has some talented riders, but she's not the you know super team, and it, it means that people are going to chase her down. It means that she's going to have to do work, and that's got to be frustrating. But at the same time, I like how you pointed out, Cosmo. I mean, it seemed like she really was going all in for for her own you know Swiss result, and also yeah, maybe there's some aspect of. She races with with most of these riders all year. Maybe that gives her a little bit of a tactical advantage. Obviously, it didn't work out in the end, but I think that's cool. That's a cool dynamic, and and the and the good side of it, as you said, uh, we'll talk about maybe the bad side in a bit. Although, yeah, we we might have differing opinions there. We should talk about Misha Bredewald, though. Uh, what a year, first of all, for her. What a month for her. She won a World Tour race at the start of September. Uh, she's raced quite a bit in September. She raced the Simac Ladies Tour. She raced the Tour de Romandy. Goes out and wins this race. And I think it's just another... I mean, yes, she won it for the Netherlands, and we shouldn't talk too much about SD Works, but like, just another example of SD Works having such talent at such a young age, too. She's 23. I think this gives this team yet another rider they can rely on to fire off those sorts of attacks, the sort of attacks that Marlon Royster can fire off. With the likes of Webus and Kopecky as sort of the riders who make everyone else not want to chase. And it just to me, it says, you know, okay, do you, does SD Works need any more? No, but they have more, even more than we've seen most of the year. And we've seen just in September how great Misha Bredebold is. She's obviously super strong. And I think specifically this race, right? Again, it's not necessarily SD Works, but just that Dutch team that they had and it kind of almost neutralizes everybody else because everyone had to follow just so many attacks. And then when she went, she picked this moment after it had just been so balls out. And to have that effort still in her legs was really impressive. Her arrival kind of as a one of the next big things is a really impressive story. She was hit by a truck when she was, when she was training in 2018, uh, preparing for Worlds as a junior. So she was i guess 18 years old and broke a bunch of bones in her back ribs pelvis uh had a brain injury and i mean first of all to have that happen as a teenager is um, i'm sure a pretty unbelievably difficult experience that i can i can't even really imagine how hard that would have been but she worked her way back to being healthy and then over the last year she's been kind of getting better and better. And then, yeah, within the last month, it's just been a really uh, ex- impressive yeah, month of racing for, for Britta Bold, who's been very active with lots of different races on her calendar, including, yeah, wins. And, and I think her her skill set was on full display at, at Euros, where she put in a big attack. Uh, she also has the ability to kind of win a reduced sprint. So, yeah, really impressive from Misha Britta Bold And impressive, although completely unsurprising from the Dutch team. Uh, if you look at Euros over the past, let's see, how far back do I have to go? 2018, Marta Bastianelli won the uh, title for Italy, and ever since then, it's been Dutch racers all the way. So, hardly did a they, surprise. When did they add the kit? Has that always existed? Or I feel like there hasn't always been a, a regional, local, what is the term? Continental champions kit? I, I feel like it's... I feel like that ups the, ups the value, value, but the, the prestige of the I agree. continental. Because uh, you know, wearing a wearing a cool kit, it makes you stand out. It makes you look, people notice you, and it makes your your trade team a little more visible. Even though it removes some of the sponsor, uh, like you know, you're kind of limited in terms of color and branding. But I think yeah, Ruth, you've won and, a national champions jersey. I mean, what. <laughs> were your sponsors mad that you that you had yeah to i was kind of like what what does that do i mean because you know it does take the logo a little bit out of the picture but like let maybe it's a little different if you're racing for a team that's based in the u.s i'm, I'm assuming they were pleased 
Uh, oh, yeah. Wearing the U.S. national team kit is a big – or the national championship kit, sorry, is um really special and a big deal, I think, for any team to have that, especially as a U.S.-based team. But, yeah, wearing a jersey that you win at a one-off race like this is a really, really big deal. I think it's so special to just be reminded every time that you get dressed that you won that big race that happens once a year. And, it, and it, even if you didn't – even if you won it, whatever, three years ago, you're always a European champion. You know, like that's, I think people say the same with Flanders or something like that. Once you won Flanders, you've always won Flanders. It doesn't go away. Uh, but there's no jersey that you get to wear all year round that reminds people that you won Flanders. So it just makes you feel good. A little ego boost every day. <laughs> and just from, yeah. There's a lot of great races you lose. So if you get to win one and remember it every time you get dressed, then it's really special. I also, I mean, personally, I, I do love the jerseys that, that come out of the Euros. I think they look really cool. So yeah, good on. It's, also, it, it's clear that it's the European champions jersey. I remember yes. seeing the Euro, the North American continental jersey in cyclocross and being like, "What is that? What's going? Why?" <laughs> but it's a little, you know, it's a little trickier because there is not a North American Union thing like they have the European Union. Um, yeah. Although, in, if you're from Norway and you're not part right. of the EU yes. and you win this race, you still wear. I was confused about that because of the UK as well. I was like, yeah, hey. it is a little interesting. There's like, plenty of European countries. I can't that are not. go to Europe on my British passport anymore <laughs> because it's not in the European Union, but they're still racing. And I was confused. Yeah. And it does, I mean, I think it kind of highlights with the continental jerseys. It, it is the Euro jersey is so important. Whereas, I, I mean, I, I feel like the other continental titles are less valued, get less coverage. Put it that way. Well, it's also because cycling is so horribly Eurocentric. It's also exactly like yeah. less competitive, right? I mean, I don't right. know. I, was there Ruth? Did you ever race a for a continental North American event or? No, I did uh, Pan Am Games once, which are every four, three or four years, I think. It's like the year before the Olympics. Um, mm -hmm. But besides that, I never went to the Pan Am Championships that happen yearly. But yeah, I mean, like you said, look at the top 10 results. It's basically the best 10 in the whole world, right? So I think above just a national championship for Europeans or non-Europeans, it's another kind of like mini worlds. No offense to the rest of us who weren't that, like countries that weren't there, <laughs> but it's just kind of the case for them. So I think they all like to race their bikes and they all want to see if they could beat each other whether they're on sd works or a different team and so if you get to feel like you're super good because you beat everybody then you know it's really fun <laughs> all right let's uh let's talk about the men's race cosmo who set the scene sure uh same i think same course as far as i could tell long day a lot of breaks uh italy decides it wants to catch the break around 30k to go uh puts a lot of riders on the front um Ghana attacks about 2K later and shreds the field down to about 30. And then almost immediately there's a crash um, on some fencing at 26K to go that I'll talk about later. But that really was the selection. We ended up with a group of about a dozen with a lot of top rider, top domestic uh, combinations from uh, various countries. Um, toppers. Hmm? What the Dutch call them? They call them toppers. Toppers? Really? Yeah, I always see Super that when I go over to Wheeler Flitz. It's like toppers. toppers. That's what the. If you're a okay. Dutch listener, maybe you could tell us what that means exactly. But I'm pretty sure it just means a top rider, right? I, the, anyway, the, go ahead. The least top topper, I think, of the group was uh, Francis Dujardin, who put in a monster pole heading into the last lap of 14K to go, which probably should have been a signal that Laporte was about to do something, and he did something around 12K, went solo. Uh, I it did seem to very be a very well measured solo effort. Like he 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 seemed to ride pretty thoughtfully versus just like exploding himself. Uh, he got a gap of about thirty seconds. Uh, De Arnaud Lee eventually wound that up inside or coming into the final K for Wout Van Aert. Van Aert went. Um, it's kind of a double climb in the finish. So there's a big climb. There's a downhill. There's a kind of tricky corner, but not really. Sweeping corner that you can misjudge coming into one final ascent. Uh, Van Art on that final climb, came out of the corner fast, attacked, got alongside Laporte. They looked at each other, and then Van Art uh, sat down, and Laporte won the race. Uh, I will say that it is a very 
it feels watching it like at pro speeds, it's a race to the last corner just because it's so much longer to kind of come around the outside of that last little bend and you've got, you know, maybe 50 meters. But at the same time, it looked really weird. It was not a finish that I have in my collection of bike race watching experience. Maybe my Cat 3 brain just can't comprehend it. But it, it seemed very odd that Laporte would come, or that Van Art would come up to Laporte with a ton of momentum. Uh, and then both be unable to come around him and that Laporte would have a last additional spurt saved for finishing this race faster than fan art. Um, also of note in third place was uh, Olav Kui on another uh, Jumbo Visma rider who sat down at the exact same time as Van Art. Again, it could all have been just that's how everyone's legs were, but it felt a little unusual for the finish of a bike race um, and maybe influenced perhaps by the their trade team somehow. I don't know. I have no conspiracy theories there. It just looked an unusual finish. Okay, first of all, I'd like to point out that the um, description of your brain as a Cat 3 brain amused me. I, I think there was a meme page that's like the cat three brain cannot comprehend this. And there was some weird thing that, what does that mean for my race. cat five brain? I don't know. I don't know. It's not, you... it's not good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, I think it means that Ruth is, is, is bigger brained than us. Uh, I mean, we knew that going in, right? Different we, brain. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, all right. But what, what a, you mentioned the crash and we should talk about that first, just cause you know, chronological order. Cause we're going to talk about the finale in a second, but what did you see in that crash? There's a bunch of fencing on the road at 26K to go, and I don't know if I just can't see what it's there for, but it's, like, discontinuous. Like, there isn't, like, a whole line of fencing. There's just a little patch of it. It's very close to the road. Maybe it's trying to keep people out of a particularly deep ditch. But if I had to choose between crashing into a wet ditch in the Netherlands versus crashing into the, you know, un... un like, it's naked bare metal fencing with little feet that stick out. It's the bad fencing, basically. Uh, I think I might choose the ditch because um, it's soft and the fencing is hard. Uh, but that that crash really made the final selection in this race in a way that I'm not sure the race course itself could have. Um, yeah, it, it took Ghana out of it, who really Italy had been kind of the main protagonists in that at that point in the race. He chased super hard despite being like a minute and a half down, like just just would take a miracle for him to have gotten back in it. But yeah, I don't know why that fencing is there. And I feel like it gave us a very different finale to this race than we might, we might otherwise have had. Uh, two talking points off of that. First of all, if you haven't seen Stefan Kung, the Ugh. images of him post crash and the time trial, I mean, first of all, graphic content warning, but also pretty unreal how, how bloodied he was by crashing. Again, barriers played a role, although in that instance, I think he also wasn't paying enough attention to the road. As Single rider crash. Happens, if you're, yeah, tucked into the arrow position. Uh, but yeah, barriers had an impact on the races. Uh, no pun intended. They definitely took riders out of both TT and road race. The other point I wanted to make is that Philip Ogana has, in the past uh, month, he's very much come into his own as a non-time-trialing star. And he's made some statements about his abilities to contest, maybe not win yet, but we might be getting there, not just when he is time-trialing. And I'm very impressed by that, and I think Ineos is probably pretty pleased about that considering the fact that their Grand Tour aspirations are not what they once were. So, yeah, a shame for Ghana that, that the crash kind of took him out of contention, but... He had an impressive ride all the same on the day. Uh, Ruth, I know you want to talk about mental energy. That's what it says in the run sheet. And uh, yeah, it seems like it would take some mental energy to, well, get up after that crash and try to chase back on. But but what else required mental energy here? I think just this style of racing, it's so just on the whole time and so twisty and turny that it's not just about you know, attacking, but it's about being in the right position and when to attack and just being able to respond to other people's attacks constantly. It's just never ending. I mean, they still race for a long time. So before they even get to these circuits, it's just you're in 
the, on these roads that are just narrow and twisty and there's so much that it takes to come to these circuits with enough energy and you're and it's not just literally if you've eaten enough and energy in your legs but just having that mental capacity to stay focused and stay on it in these really tight twisty racing situations having never raced them and watched them a bunch i think that's make, that's dead on there was there was some after the after the Ghana crash there was a section of fence where Laporte, he's kind of on the inside of the road, and you see him just kind of like jolt over to his right um, and kind of bump into the group. And it's not a big, it's not a big, you know, moment in the race, but it's definitely noticeable. And it almost seems like he's just like he has that awareness and that like spider sense because I think it's the same section of fence that uh, like 60k in the go in the women's race. There was a little touch of wheels and someone got caught up on it. It's another section of that kind of naked fence. It's very close to the road. And I think his ability to like have that focus this deep into that race really kind of contributed to his ability to get away and eventually win. Um, so yeah, Ruth, have there been races where you felt like you your your mental energy was either a reason you won or lost? Like you felt like maybe you had more than everybody else, or maybe you didn't have it on the day. Uh, that's the difference between doing well and getting dropped. <laughs> it's, it's that. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. extremely, I think maybe everybody's a little different, but for me, it's very black and white. If I am not mentally there, then just kiss goodbye to anything. I think it's to some level there for everybody, obviously, but I do think that some riders are different than others. And those are the riders that you'll see where they're either like really, really winning or they're just like not really there. You know what I mean? And I think there are a lot of riders that do a good job of keeping it in check uh, and just trying to do their best on the day. But I think everybody falls prey to being mentally fatigued at some point, you know, and whether that's early on in the race and you crash out sooner or whether that's just later or whether that's your Marlon Royce and you sit on the side of the road in the middle of a time trial. Like I don't, it kind of shows up in many different ways. I, I love that aspect. Like just hearing that because it's such, there's so many things that get marketed or analyzed as like everything is CDA versus power. Everything is Watts versus power. And it's like people forget that the I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bend the Lebowski quote about the brain being the biggest erogenous zone into like the brain being the biggest, you know, race factor. The, the brain being the most powerful race muscle. I don't know. I can't, I can't do it, but. I think another great example would even maybe be Kopecky in this situation. If you watch Worlds, she was not losing that race. There was like no way in her brain that she wasn't giving everything. And then for Europeans, it's not that she didn't want to win, but I feel like she didn't race in the same way because maybe to her that wasn't like the big huge race she'd been looking for all year right she'd spent so much mental energy on worlds doing everything and then here she just she followed and she obviously still did really well but she didn't attack it like she had she didn't own that race and I think that was a great example of someone that came into the year and was like here are the races that I'm going to own and that's going to be the Tour de France Femmes and Wilts, and she did that and the other races she was there but you can totally see the races she cherry picked and was like this is where I'm going to show up and the other ones I'll be there and I'm going to do my best but I've set my goals and I think athletes that perform really well are the ones that specifically set goals and they know those well ahead of time and that doesn't mean they won't try in all of the other ones but you can see the edge that they have in those specific ones they did pick. Do, do you feel like the mental energy side of things is something that you can train? I mean in your career were you able to to or have you been able to kind of get better at that is it something that you have to maintain the way that you maintain the, the physical side or is it just kind of always there or not I think you can train it I think it comes with a little bit of wisdom and a lot with picking the days that you're going to really show up because it's just not possible to race 50 60 times a year and show up in that same way every single time you get on a start line and a lot of people will give themselves a hard time if they don't show up that way which is just, again, mentally fatiguing. So if you can pick your however many days that those are your days you're showing up 100 and how much percent or whatever, and then you can just like give yourself a little bit of a break on all of the other days because you can't win everything. Um, and it's hard to show up in that manner all of the time. It just makes you super tired by the end of the year. On that note, it certainly seemed like Christophe Laporte was all in. Cosmo, I know you have opinions about whether or not his team, his trade team dynamics had an impact there. To me, it looked like he was all in, and it certainly also looked to me like Art and 
with the help of Arnaud Delis, did want to bring him back in the very end. I, I thought that was a pretty... It, it, to look to me like they were they were going all in in the chase. Speaking of riders who, you know, decide on targets on the year, Christophe Laporte has now won the Euro title. He's won Doors of Lander and Getaway Vlgem, of course, that, you know, had a little bit of help from Wout van Aert. Uh, whereas Wout van Aert is there all the time and yet constantly just kind of second or third. Uh, but yeah, to me, it did seem like he was going in. Go, kind of bouncing off what, what Ruth said about Kopecky, I feel like if Van Aert is going to win the race and is committed to winning the race, the finish doesn't look like what it looked like at Euros. <laughs> like, that looked like a guy who was like, he wanted to win the race if he could. He worked really hard to get there. You know, there's, there's, they're in a good situation. Maybe they could do it. But, you know, it would be hard to power around the port or because he's got the inside line around this corner. I'm just going to sit down like it. I'm not saying, wow, well, threw in the towel. I'm not saying he threw the race. I'm not saying it was pre-orchestrated, but like, it didn't look like wow. Van Art at his, at his top, like 1000%. I am going to win this race. I'm going to claw everyone else's eyeballs out to win this race. Um, and maybe that's kind of what I'm reacting to when I, when I see that finish, like he gave it, he did, did a huge effort to close the gap down. And it just, it seemed like he wasn't a thousand percent committed to getting across the line to take this title. Do, I mean, do you feel like that Laporte getting away in the first place was influenced by the trade team dynamics? I don't know. I mean, I think Dujard, I think he definitely, that was Laporte's best play, I think. Um, I think he he definitely looked like a guy who was trying, like like I said, his it wasn't like a dumb attack. It wasn't like a, well, my trade team teammates will protect me now that my, my one national team teammate is tired. Uh, yeah, I... I thought, I thought he was fully committed, but it didn't look like a, a level of commitment like you would see with Capecchio Worlds. Like, it definitely was like, I want to win this race, but it wasn't a... It seemed almost like he, he found himself in a better opportunity that he might have had to win the race and took full advantage of it, but it didn't... I don't know. I, I'm kind of circling on this one, but yeah. I feel like regardless of where you stand on that, I, I think it, it's another example of, and, and honestly, regardless of whether you, where you stand on kind of like national, national team versus trade team races, I think it's another example of why cycling is so entertaining. I mean, you can't really get this in, in other, I feel like it's often marketed as an endurance sport. It's put in the same category with other quote unquote endurance sports, but like this doesn't happen in marathon. Right. Like if we're talking about during, if the commentators who are there to just, not have that many opinions, but just talk about what the action is. Make the, 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 the sport more accessible, more appealing to the audience. If they are talking about the implications of trade team tactics during a national team race, then like national team racing has issues. Um, and again, it's a good storyline and it's compelling, but is it necessarily good racing? Like, I don't know. I want good storylines. I want compelling. That, that's all it's I ask so, for. That's what we saw at the Vuelta, right? The, the like the the chaos, the chaos monkey teammates uh, of Jumbo Visma in the GC were like incredible internet fodder for everybody. It was, Everyone that's true. loved it. The content was quality. Um, but was the actual racing as good as it could have been? I don't know. Does it matter if the content was quality? All right. Well, first of all, we're going to talk Grand Tours in a second. We're going to do a little a, rant, a Grand Tour wrap. But first, were there any big takeaways from Luxembourg? Can Brandon McNulty win the Tour de France, right? Is that is that what I'm supposed to say? Because he came in second to a teammate, only by three seconds too. Yeah, he almost he almost took it back in the TT, and obviously it's a TT. Like you don't need permission to ride hard in a TT. Um, I bet you do from some teams. I'm not going to name names, but I bet there's teams out there who you would need to ask permission for <laughs> riding hard. And I could I can think very clearly of one or two teams where I bet you they have strong opinions about this. But anyway, Brennan McNulty, can he win? Maybe. We should point Mark Hershey, his teammate, won the overall. Uh, ben Healy took a stage that kind of shook up the GC, and there were some group sprints on the other side of that. You know, it's a it's a two pro. I don't know how, to, how deep we need to dig into it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. I do think it's a good result both for Hershey and McNulty for different reasons in that Hershey, I mean, since joining that team, has just done very little. He seemed so yeah. promising uh, as of... What, 20, 21? How old is he? He's only 25, and he only just turned 25. Although, you know, in cycling terms in 2023, how come he hasn't won two tours de France yet? Uh, 
but yeah, I, you know, this year he really did kind of start racking up the results, and um, I'm sure he and the team are are pleased with that after kind of a slow-ish start to his UAE career. Yeah, and then McNulty as well, I mean, somebody who um, has kind of started to rack up the results this year. Obviously, took a Grand Tour stage win, national title in the TT. So yeah, congrats to those riders, and I don't think we need to do too much more on that. Let's let's wrap up the Grand Tour season though. Let's let's close out the show by. I don't know, maybe discussing some takeaways. My first thought was to do kind of like awards, but honestly, I, I'm i pretty sure the best men's team and the best men's domestique of the Grand Tours, those awards seem like, do we need to have that much of a conversation? I don't <laughs> I, I don't think that there's that much of a discussion here. We're all in agreement that Yumbo Visma is the team of the men's Grand Tour season, right? Mm, yep. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they, their, their best domestique won the Vuelta, his third Grand Tour of the year. So not to go all in on, you know, rah-rah American riders, but I feel like we can say this impartially, too, that he was he was uh, the domestique of the year. Seb Kuz, women's side, again, team of the year seems to me pretty obvious in that it's SD Works. I'm making a funny face right now. Yeah. The the viewers well, or the listeners can't see your funny face. Who 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 won who won who won the Vuelta? Was it was it Este Works? There was a pee break, if you may recall. Yes. I would also I would also point out the same person who won the Vuelta also won the Giro. Also won so the Giro. You're saying yeah yeah that's the, true. Per, the, the the team and rider that won the two of the three Grand Tours. You are not listing as the. I agree though. I think Demi Vuelta. So wait, is, hold on. Is so does, does that mean that Movistar is the team of the? No. Okay. I just don't think it's as it's as it's as black and white as you're making it sound. I think comparing Yumbo Visma, what Yumbo Visma did on the men's side, to what SD Works That's did true. on That's the women's true. side is not apt. But Ruth, are you are you SD Works as best team of the Grand Tours? I think that as a team, even though they may be what they're not comparable to what Yumbo Visma did, I think, but still, yes, best team. Uh, all right. The one thing that it, I might be a little bit more of a discussion. Who's the domestique of the year of the Grand Tours? I think that Christine Majerus never gets enough love. She probably did a lot of work early on that we didn't pay attention to very often, just from SD Works. She's like, uh, you know, SD Works is sort of like the ship of Theseus of good cycling teams where <laughs> it doesn't matter who's on the team. <laughs> but at the same time, she is the, the plank of that ship that has always been there. You know, she's always. been there forever. <laughs> I never. <laughs> Dane, you might have to you might have to unpack that reference a little bit. <laughs> okay, so in 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 fifteen seconds, if uh, if you have a ship but you're constantly replacing the planks and, and the sails and all that stuff, uh, you know, at what point does it become a new ship or is it always the same ship? Is is sort of the the question of this philosophical metaphor based around the Greek hero Theseus, which, yeah, ship of Theseus. Uh, and I feel like with this team, there's just constant in and out of great riders over time this was the team of there was a time when this was the team of i was gonna say lizzie dignan but she wasn't even lizzie dignan when she was a star with this team this was this was the lizzie armitstead team and but then it was the end of Bregan team and, and now it's the demi volaring team and all, all these other a lot of and all these other great riders christy myros has been there like for so long and she's just a rock for this team so good for her she doesn't get enough credit she's one of the few riders on this team that doesn't win all the time because she is such a loyal domestique uh, mm. so yeah maybe we should we should give her a shout out finally great domestique work throughout the season but especially at the Tour de France where your teammates finished first and second and won the points classification yeah all right uh what are the under the radar moments that kind of stood out to you uh, both this year i don't know if it was under the radar but i think remco is while still being exceptionally good, uh, is not maybe uh, going to be the Grand Tour dominator that uh, all of Belgium wants him to be. Um, not that he's bad. I mean, he definitely in the mountains he seems to play a weak hand very well. But when we saw him, yeah, he dropped out of the Giro because he was sick. But he and he had you know a pretty serious implosion at the Vuelta, but. When you win Grand Tours, you don't have implosions, right? Like, you can you can go. There are plenty of riders who've gone out and won a ton of stages and been super strong, look great, KOM titles, 
I think there are a lot fewer who can con- ride consistently well enough for three weeks to win a Grand Tour, and I think Remco might not be that guy. I do think it's a little early, right? I mean, he's he's still I, very young. Yes, but <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, the the poster on the side of the movie theater is Remco will destroy the world, and then you go in there and it's like, you know, Remco winning some convincing stages, but not factoring in the GC at any of the Grand Tours. So I wonder if this like mental part that I kind of brought up a bit earlier comes to play with him quite a lot. I kind of feel like it does, but it's hard to know. Like I'm not friends with him. I don't know. Well, he does have that. I mean, you, what, what you kind of pointed out where the riders are just like on fire some days and some days they're not. I mean, that's, that's kind of true for him. I think it's true for Vanderpool as well. Uh, but yeah, that might, might be part of it. I, I, I also think it, it's sort of a sign of the times where we're already, I, I think it is already at least a reasonable point that you make Cosmo that maybe, maybe Remco is not a grand tour uh, superstar. I think that's a reasonable point, even though it's a little nutty to say that about someone so young. And the reason it's a reasonable point is that, like, as I already said, I mean, by the time you're in your mid twenties, apparently, you need to be winning Grand Tours. <laughs> a decade ago, it was like you turn twenty nine and then you can be a Grand Tour contender. It seemed, <laughs> or at least that was true of Chris Froome and Garen Thomas. And then the paradigm seems to have changed. I mean, ri- riders are no longer, you know, later twenties when they're first starting to be Grand Tour racers. And we see it on both the men's and the women's side. Obviously, Annemiek van Vleuten is a bit of an anomaly, but on the women's side as well, you have plenty of very young riders who are contesting big wins. So yeah, maybe maybe we can actually start to make those, draw those conclusions about riders. Although, I don't think Remco's had that much uh, time to show us what he really is. We'll see. Ruth, any other uh, just sort of overarching thoughts that you came away from the Grand Tour season with? The only thing that I could really think of was that we had some really good U.S. women doing quite well before they had crashed out or didn't get to race the rest of the season. And I think that that was something that I was a little bit sad to miss out on with Veronica Ewers particularly um, crashing out with her broken collarbone and not seeing Kristen Faulkner race the rest of the year after she had such a strong spring. I think she would have also had some good, good, GC stage stage days at least I th- I think she would have um so for me that was the only thing that I kind of thought maybe went a little bit unnoticed just because we didn't have them race <laughs> I mean Chloe Diger too just really Chloe Diger to raced own. really well yeah, yeah she um it was really cool to see her out there maybe on that note uh, is there a rider that comes to mind for either of you for most improved Grand Tour racer I don't know if this is obvious but I think the Capecchi um, did really well. No, in I think that's, that's actually a really good one. Yeah. Um, and she hasn't really in the past. So that was pretty cool to see her be on the podium. I think her climbing was astounding. Like the, the way that, uh, the way that she has evolved is, is really impressive. And I mean, I say this literally every week, but it's like as if that team needs more things <laughs> to go their way. Yeah. Cosmo. I was going to go with Cassia Nivia Doma. I think she's uh, has not always been the savviest of riders, and I think she rode really well at the Tour de France, especially on the Queen stage. Really seemed to have a a focus and a plan and um, a mental fortitude that she has maybe not demonstrated uh, in previous years. So, I mean, second to the best Grand Tour rider in the world, pretty solid. So, yeah, stop it. Uh, it's been a little while since. He was racing Grand Tours because he raced the Tour and didn't race the Vuelta. But I'm going to give a shout-out to Adam Yates, who did finish on the podium at the Tour de France. He's a rider that British cycling commentators have been kind of hyping up, expecting to do big things for years, finally got on to a Grand Tour podium at the biggest Grand Tour of them all this year. Yes, he was more than 10 minutes down on the leader. (laughs) But if we're talking most improved, I think he improved pretty dramatically to even be on the podium at the Tour de France. That's not something that I would have expected for him. Uh, he animated, he was... too. It was like an interesting third place. Like, I will I will take an interesting... A, GC, a good GC finish with interesting bits versus, like, I'm going to do well in the time trials and not lose time in the climbs. Yeah, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't an anonymous yes. third place. And, and yeah, I, I also... I mean, I think he showed many times outside of the Grand Tours this year that he is not an anom- anonymous rider. I mean, he he goes out and tries to win stuff. He won Montreal, 
just two weeks ago. So, yeah, he's he's a rider that I think took a big step forward. And UAE, well, let's yeah. I mean, I I, I wanted to talk about this too as as a talking point for Grand Tour seasons. I think UAE actually showed a lot of improvement as a as a team where they had Adam Yates, Juan Ayuso is coming into his own. This is a strong team. So I think we would I think in in most other years we might be talking about UAE's improvement as a team and and their strength across the board except for the fact that it kind of didn't matter because Yumbo was that much better in every race. Uh and we saw that no matter what UAE did even bringing on Adam Yates even trying this strategy where you you, know, you, you threaten Jonas Vingago with two different potential riders and which I loved, by the way. It, it didn't matter. I mean, he still won by a huge margin. He won the Tour de France. And so, on the one hand, good on UAE for getting better around Tade, not just Tade Pogacar, but on the other hand, it didn't really matter. Uh, other side of the spectrum, remember when Ineos like, won Grand Tours all the time? It's uh, a yeah. bit of a change. Things changed. Gary Thomas got close, we should say. Other than that, it's been a um, bit of a, a bit of a drought for that team, and Teo Gegenhardt's heading to Little Trek. So, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see things getting that much better for them in the near future. Uh, this year's Grand Tours were not a great sign for times to come. I mean, their best Grand Tour racer is very much in the twilight of his career. So, yeah, uh, Ruth on the women's side. Do you feel like you know we talked about how? Annemiek van Vleuten may have won two Grand Tours, but she's going to be you know, out of the picture. So do we see anybody else? Did you see anybody else who you think might be able to challenge SD Works next year with Annemiek van Vleuten gone? I'd love to see maybe Gaia Raelini give it a good go on the you know, climb, super climbing stages. I think she has to gain a little bit of experience in where to be and when, it seemed like. Kind of the crazy entrances to climbs and super key moments she wasn't always there exactly when she needed to be but I think if she gains a little experience with that and maybe a bit more confidence to be less of Elisa Longo Borghini's wing woman and more of her own rider that I think we could see a lot from her and I guess even uh, Longo Borghini herself she had a pretty rough year and I think she's got a good good chance of at least giving it a better crack than she was able to this year all right I think we've I think we've been relatively comprehensive in our in our pretty serious conversation for September 25th at near the very end of the racing season. I feel like we can call it there and I do think uh, there's a pretty big news story out there that might get some chatter on the placeholders this week, but I'm going to leave it for them cuz if is, if is we it talk really a news story. It might be. I mean, it's, it's a news like, story like for sure. Like supermarket tabloid. The the placeholders want to discuss this. So I am go- we're going to leave the Sudal Yumbo potential merger conversation for another pod on this network. You just, you spoiled it. We were gonna we had a good cliffhanger there to make people do placeholders, and yeah, now they know right, what I'm it sorry. is. And if they're not interested, but you got to give them a little bit, right? You can't just tell them like go listen. There's something interesting. Do do we? I don't. I mean, yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> go listen to placeholders. Ask also, listen to Wheel Talk. I think you should listen. Not to Geek, Geek Warning, Warning though. No, I think <sighs> yeah. Damn. Bit of how are we gonna win? Yeah, a bit of rivalry there. Hope you enjoyed the show. Listen to our other podcasts. Head over to escapecollective.com slash join. And we'll see you when we see you. Cosmo, Ruth, thanks as always for chatting. Thank you.